Good day to all of you and thank you for inviting me to give this talk at this wonderful meeting. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me specifically for uh, me to cover a topic which is close to my heart. I'll be talking to you about the differential diagnosis of diabetes in the young in India and insights into the mechanisms and the patterns of uh, these diseases. I'll be covering a fair amount in terms of what our original work in Velo is as far as these conditions are concerned. This is indeed the most comprehensive publication when it comes to the epidemiology of diabetes in India. Unfortunately, what it shows is largely what belongs to type 2 diabetes and from a clear perspective, we do not have information as far as diabetes in the young is concerned in this country in terms of the epidemiology. Nevertheless, let us focus on the classification of diabetes as far as the WHO is concerned. And uh, this uh, slide shows you the 2019 classification, an updated version. Uh, we have for you type 1 and type 2 diabetes, of course, as the key and common forms of diabetes. And then we have the new form, the hybrid forms of diabetes, which involve two types. And then the categories, which are the other specific types and unclassified forms uh, at the bottom. So I will not cover type 1 and type 2 diabetes because these are talks which are going to be covered in the next few days. I will go straight to the baseline algorithm as far as we are concerned to help you make a diagnosis. A detailed history is required, a good pedigree chart and a physical examination. The measurement of C-peptide levels should not be understated and in fact plays a very important role from a cost perspective of differentiating the various forms of diabetes. The GAD antibodies are a basic a test in the armamentarium and of course imaging of the abdomen is also required and I shall show you how it is so vital. The other tests which I've outlined over here are those which actually play a role in terms of quaternary care these tests may not be possible to be done at the uh, primary or secondary care and may need to be, particularly the genetic testing need, can be done only in about three or four centers across the country. So let me focus first on the hybrid forms of diabetes, slowly evolving immune mediated diabetes of adults. Here is a clinical example, a 29 year old male with a history of uh, osmotic symptoms uh, and weight loss in four months. Uh, there is no family history, which is also key to the diagnosis. His body mass index is 20 kg per meter squared. He's underweight, the ketones are negative, and the glycemic control was easy in the first one year with oral anti-diabetic agents. He required insulin uh, thereafter. So on testing, he was found to be GAD antibody positive. His C-peptide levels were extremely low and his imaging of the abdomen did not show a shrunken pancreas or any calcification. So the type of diabetes over here that we are dealing with, because it is immune mediated, this is a slowly evolving immune mediated diabetes of adults, formerly called LADA, uh, generally seen above the age of uh, 35 years. Having said that, this comes into the bucket where it is not a typical type 1 diabetes. The autoimmune Islet cell markers are positive and the therapy requires insulin and generally basal bolus insulin works much better. I shall go next to the second form of hybrid diabetes or the ketone prone type 2 diabetes. This is largely reported from populations across Africa, African American populations in the United States and Chinese populations until more recently was not reported commonly from South Asia. These patients have unprovoked ketoacidosis, are generally more than 30 years of age. Having said that, in India, they could be younger. The autoantibodies are negative, and they have an explosive onset with a high insulin requirement. The rapid reduction of insulin requirement is seen within about three months. None of them will require insulin, and they can be maintained with oral antidiabetic agents and even dietary control in a subset of patients. First described in Brooklyn, in New York, and in a suburb known as Flatbush, and therefore called Flatbush diabetes. 
So we first reported a large cohort in the year 2017, and this was the first large cohort from South Asia, which showed very clearly that this entity existed in South India. And what was the defining feature was that the C-peptide levels at baseline were extremely low with diabetic ketoacidosis, but within a period of about three to four months, the C-peptide levels, particularly in the postprandial phase, showed a rise. And uh, you can see over here that we had two groups, a group which had ketoacidosis with GAD antibody positive and the ones without GAD antibody positivity. And essentially, those patients without GAD antibody positivity, in fact, had a remission and were able to be controlled with just oral anti-diabetic agents at the end of three months or so. Insulin was discontinued in all those patients who were GAD antibody negative. Uh, the baseline characteristics that they tended to be overweight, more common in males, and there was a strong family history of type 2 diabetes in addition. So this condition exists in India and we need to think about it in our younger patients who have diabetes which appears to be like type 1 in the initial phase. Let me turn to the other forms of uh, uh, diabetes, which include the monogenic forms. And of course, for this particular audience, you're all extremely familiar with the monogenic forms. But I shall give you a little bit of uh, perspective from an Indian uh, viewpoint. You can see over here Modi, classically thought to be an age of onset less than 25 years, three generation family history with siblings involvement and generally non-insulin requirement. They are thought to be monogenic and are usually associated with a non-obese state. If you look at the latest WHO classification, all 14 types are not cited over here. And the reason for this is that it has largely been found that these patients are thought to be not typically Modi in a certain subgroup. For example, certain types like the Neuro D1, which have been reported previously as MODI, do not fulfill the full criteria when it comes to looking at pathogenic variants. Having said that, we could go either way in two groups, one which are certainly the monogenic forms and which the WHO classification now fits in, the GCK or MODI type 2, uh, the HNF1 alpha MODI type 3, HNF4 alpha type 1, and the mitochondrial forms have also been put under the basket of young onset diabetes in addition. These are the common forms which have been reported, and we have also reported Wolfram's and uh, MODI 12 or ABCC8 mutations in our young adult population with MODI. So this was our publication which came out in the year 2014 which gave a slightly different perspective. It was the first NGS-based publication from India at that point of time. And we tried to answer these questions, which I had initially posed to you. So here are some classical cases. Note the extremely intense pedigree chart, which is so important to be drawn when you're trying to make a diagnosis in these patients. Also, in addition, please see uh, the patient over here with the intense presentation from the uh, male side of the family. The glucokinase mutation is positive over here and it's MODI2. The next patient over here who presents with uh, evidence of uh, MODI5, renal cysts in addition, as you can see over here. And this is a spreadsheet of our initial patients who presented over here, who uh, basically presented with uh, different forms, and you can see the commonality of MODI6, the neuro D1 mutations over here. So, the neuro D1 mutations, which were more common, and MODI12 with the ABCC8, which is also more common in our adult population. So, besides this, of course, we had the full spread of 14 mutations present in our adult population. What I would also like to highlight over here in this population is that there were a number of patients who were obese at presentation with the typical uh, pedigree chart. And there were patients at the other end of the spectrum who were lean with low BMIs in addition. So let me recap and say MODI6, MODI4, and MODI13 were the common forms in our series. Over here, we show 
a patient with a diagenic mutation. You can see on the maternal side, we have MOD12, ABCC8, and a Pax4 mutation on the paternal side. And the child, the index case, who's a boy, has both mutations and has more severe diabetes. So there's a dose effect. Uh, insulin requirement in the child, whereas the, both the parents required only oral anti-diabetic agents, even though they had a relatively young onset at presentation. And we have reported more multigenic or polygenic presentations for MODI in addition in our series. We have also looked at uh, young pregnant women who were in their first trimester, who had BMIs ranging from 19 to 21. And those of us who treated these patients, the ones with the more severe disease with insulin were screened in this particular study, which was published in PLUS One. And we have therefore identified that almost 18% of patients who presented with insulin requirement in the first trimester had in fact MODI. And in fact, their initial presentation was not before they became pregnant. It is when they became pregnant, they were screened and they were found to have uh, hyperglycemia and we identified these mutations. So it should be thought about in these young ladies in particular. So let me summarize. Modi is seen in about 30% of our patients over here. Uh, in those who have young diabetes, these are the common forms. A large volume of these patients are picked up in adulthood, some being clearly missed in childhood. Pregnant women with diabetes and an autosomal history have MODI. MODI could also be diagenic in origin. And we have a single window 40 gene panel for young diabetes using NGS, which can be cost effectively used for diagnosing young onset diabetes and MODI. The next patient is a 28 year old with lean diabetes for 15 years. In fact, I thought she probably had pancreatic diabetes because she had evidence of uh, a shrunken pancreas and calcification. But then uh, her daughter presented uh, to the pediatric neurologist with exquisite myopathy and weakness. And uh, this was notified to me. So we put two and two together and we did NGS uh, looking for the degree of heteroplasmy in our patients. And we found indeed that the mother and the daughter had the same mitochondrial mutation. And heteroplasmy, which is minimal or milder, may not be picked up with Sanger sequencing. Therefore, the advantage of NGS for diagnosing uh, mitochondrial mutations may be better and may be picked up at a much earlier point of time. The patient over here uh, had a muscle biopsy, which shows evidence of ragged red fibers in the Gomori stain. And of course, mitochondrial myopathy may be the most common presentation amongst uh, mitochondrial disorders. Other members who have diabetes in the family should be thought and should be screened for a mitochondrial disorder as well. So we know that patients with mitochondrial diabetes may have siblings who may have presentations which may be totally different. Some with deafness, some with uh, macular dystrophy, uh, patients could have been present with uh, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, with renal failure, and of, of course the classical presentation of melas with strokes and uh, myopathy of course in addition. The other forms also include those with insulin resistance. And uh, once again, the WHO classification has the common forms of insulin resistance. You as pediatricians are familiar with uh, type A insulin resistance, leprechaunism and rhabdal Mendelhall syndrome in particular. Here are a few examples of what we have seen when it came to insulin resistance. An 18-year-old female with diabetes detected at the age of 15 years on premixed insulin. And like any other young lady, she was uh, frustrated at the age of 16 and because of her control being difficult, she stopped her insulin for uh, four to five days, but she never ever went into ketoacidosis when she stopped her insulin. She had hypertriglyceridemia from the age of 15 years, and her mother too had diabetes in addition. So you can see over here the profile of the mother and the daughter. They have elevated C-peptide levels, and the HOMA IR, which is a measurement of insulin resistance, was also exquisitely elevated, particularly in the mother. And the daughter had hypertriglyceridemia. The mother was already on treatment. 
This is the body composition, as you can see, which is done using a DEXA scan. And uh, the upper part of the body, that's in the arms and in the head, the head in particular, has an in increased amount of fat distributed over there. Almost 20% of the body fat is in the region of the head, which is rather unusual. She was not otherwise grossly obese. Neither of them were grossly obese. And you can see this is basically a partial lipodystrophy, a Dunnigan variety. Uh, and once again, we did uh, NGS and picked up the mutation for the laminin gene, uh, which is classical for familial partial lipodystrophy. Uh, over here, we have another uh, young lady who has come with uh, stunting of growth and is extremely emaciated. She also has almost a total lack of subcutaneous uh, fat. And the mutation screening has been done here, the AGPAT2, which shows evidence of uh, generalized lipodystrophy, uh, which is classical uh, uh, for the Bernadelli seep uh, syndrome. The other genetic syndromes as well can be screened with uh, NGS, next generation sequencing. We can see over here uh, a young lady who came with hyperglycemia, hyperpigmentation, hypertrichosis, hypothyroidism and short stature. When we thought about short stature and diabetes, we thought perhaps because of the amenorrhea, this may be even Turner syndrome, but the FSH was not classically elevated. And she also had negative GAD antibodies with low C-peptide. So she was insulinopenic with diabetes, but she had in addition hearing loss and cardiac involvement with the bicuspic aortic valve. So essentially we did a genetic screening because of this pigmentation and she was diagnosed to have the H syndrome where the classical mutation of the SLC2983 gene was present in both her uh, as well as a Heterogen, uh, heterozygote in her mother. We come next to the disorders of the endocrine pancreas, and I would like to cover fibrocalcic pancreatic diabetes next on the list, classically presenting with abdominal pain in the first time in the first uh, decade of life, maldigestion or steatoria in the second decade, and uh, uncontrolled uh, glucose levels in the third decade, above the age of 20 years. So, this is a condition wherein imaging is critical. They usually have a shrunken pancreas with duct dilatation and exquisite calcification intraductally, as you can see here on the CT scans. And the C-peptide levels are low. It is classically described only in tropical regions. So, obviously, there is an environmental genetic interaction, which we know very little about. The environmental factors uh, have been postulated, but many of them has been dismissed in more recent times, and we still unaware of what it might be. It, the initial presentation is that of the tropical pancreatitis with uh, malabsorption by the second decade, but by the time they reach their 20s, they have diabetes. And you can see over here that we have controls which are normals, and the blue line over here shows exquisite insulin deficiency. The tropical pancreatitis has this last gasp surge of insulin levels. Therefore, the area under the curve is greater than that of the normals. Most interesting was uh, the response to indirect calorimetry. We did energy expenditure studies in these patients, and we found that those patients with pancreatic diabetes had a much higher energy expenditure uh, than what was expected for their BMI. And uh, this was in spite of the fact of correcting their glycemic control as well as giving additional uh, enzyme supplements to correct the fat malabsorption. The third feature which is classical of patients with pancreatic diabetes is this paradoxical glucagon elevation. One would expect with gross fibrosis of the pancreas that both the beta as well as the alpha cells would be destroyed. But over here, what we found was this profound increase in glucagon levels. It is seen in the phase of tropical pancreatitis before they develop diabetes, and it becomes gross once they develop fibrocalcic pancreatic diabetes, and uh, the glucagon levels are grossly elevated. What could be the reason for this?
Now, there are two possibilities. Either that the alpha cells are still functioning, for which we need to, of course, uh, take postmortem samples and look at the alpha cells and immunostain them for glucagon, or could there be another source? Now, what has been seen is that in pancreatectomized dogs, the glucagon levels are paradoxically elevated. So it could be happening that the glucagon is coming from a pro-glucagon genome which exists in the L cells of the intestine which normally produce DLP1, perhaps. So you can see over here that the pancreatic polypeptide levels are low, which indicates it is parallel to that of um, a non-functional pancreas. The P cells are also not functioning. That's the uh, blue line at the bottom over here uh, in patients who have uh, fibrocalcic pancreatitis and the controls who have a normal uh, pancreatic polypeptides. The GLP-1 response is normal, which means the L cells are functioning normally over here. A good GLP-1 response to glucose, uh, oral glucose, and the oxyntomodinin levels are also, uh, as you can see over here, elevated. So it indicates that the L cells are still functioning. So there is this every possibility that the glucagon levels which are being seen may be coming from the L cells. We haven't proven that yet, and it will need further investigation. So these patients are insulinopenic, they have profound glucagon production, uh, and the glucagon may be of L cell origin considering the concomitant rise in GLP-1 and oxytomodulin levels. They need low dose insulin therapy, they are more prone for hypoglycemia, and they need uh, enzyme supplements containing lipase, it is mandated, and you need to give them extra calories Correct the glucose, give the lipase, and at the same time, make sure they take an oral intake of more than 40%, what is expected, and some of them end up taking 2,500 to 3,000 calories of food per day to help them build up their muscle mass and improve their body weight. They have a high propensity for pancreatic cancer as well, almost 40% if they cross the age of 40. Finally, let me come to this intriguing form of diabetes, the unclassified form in our Indian population, what was initially called malnutrition modulated or protein deficient diabetes mellitus. It was included in the WHO classification till the year 1996, and then it was unceremoniously dismissed. People in the West said it did not exist, but it still does. Let me tell you, in rural areas, impoverished parts of the country, it is still very much a problem. So the international pre prevalence of undernutrition, sadly so, in spite of the uh, obesity which is there, we still have a double burden of undernutrition in our country, as you can see the yellow on the map, ranging from 5, 15 to 24 percent of the population. And thereafter, when we study the, these populations, you see that there is a prevalence of diabetes amongst all the diabetes, maybe around 1 to 5 percent, which has these peculiar characteristics. Glucose levels more than 200 at the fasting state. Onset of diabetes below the age of 30, but above the age of 15 or 20, generally speaking. Absence of ketoacidosis on withdrawal of insulin. They all come a poor, from a poor background. They need relatively higher doses of insulin, up to 60 units per day, and they are of rural origin. And when you do an imaging of the pancreas, there is no evidence of calcification or duct dilatation. So our study has actually shown that 5% of the rural Tamil Nadu population with diabetes and 1% of the urban population have this particular condition. What is it due to? Now, it's not clear exactly what, but it has been shown that malnutrition in uh, lab animals can cause a decline in insulin, glucagon, amino acids, and other insulin trophic stimuli. Uh, Ish Bhatia has shown in his studies that the phase of hyperinsulinemia and subclinical malnutrition, which then subsequently deteriorates to uh, hypoinsulinemia, is correlated with underfeeding. And we in our studies have shown that this condition is not related to the Barker hypothesis, which is a prenatal phenomenon, wherein undernutrition intranatally ultimately leads to subsequent weight gain and obesity as they become full-grown adults. And that is more the type 2 diabetes phenotype. And by and large, the diabetes over there has its onset beyond the age of 30 or 35. So it's not that condition. It is separate and related to postnatal malnutrition. 
So over here we see the physiological characteristics of these patients. First, they are lean and they also have evidence of low insulin levels. So you can see over here the lean subjects have low insulin levels, the blue line. Type 1 is the red line at the bottom and these are patients with type 2 with hyperinsulinemia in the initial phase. We have also studied their body composition using NMR spectroscopy, looking at the mitral quantities of the fat in the muscle, in the liver, in the abdomen, and also in the uh, pancreas. And what we have shown is that the NMR spectroscopy show that visceral fat is abnormally high for a low BMI. These are lean normals with BMIs of less than 19. These are type 1, which also have low intra-abdominal fat. But the malnutrition modulated diabetes have visceral fat, which is more than them, but not as high as type 2 diabetes. However, what is most striking is the NMR spec quantification of fat in the pancreas. And you can see over here that malnutrition modulated diabetes has very high pancreatic fat content. Now, whether this is an epiphenomena or is responsible for the beta cell dysfunction, is it uh, a kind of lipotoxicity for the beta cells, we do not know. And you can see clearly over here that even type 2 diabetes, though it has uh, an increase in pancreatic fat, is not as high as that of malnutrition-modulated diabetes. So let me summarize the pat pathophysiology of malnutrition-modulated diabetes. They have a significant insulin deficiency, much lower hepatocellular fat than type 2 diabetes, low visceral fat content, and exceedingly high pancreatic fat content, unlike any previous condition reported. Physiologically, they are a unique form of diabetes. It is a not a lean variant of type 2, mind you. I have shown you physiologically it is different. And they require insulin, whereas type 2 diabetes can be well managed with oral anti-diabetic agents uh, in the initial phases. So diabetes in the young, the Indian subcontinent, what does it mean? You should think about these conditions, especially when you're thinking of lean people, fibrocalcic pancreatic diabetes on the top of the list, maturity onset diabetes of the young, ketone, ketosis prone diabetes, lipodystrophy, mitochondrial diabetes, which I've talked about. I have not talked about HIV lipodystrophy that occurs in a slightly older subgroup, but patients on HIV, anti, highly active antiretroviral therapy can develop lipodystrophy and develop uh, diabetes which is insulin resistant. So these are the forms which would be commoner in the younger population. And I have just put this together with age cutoffs, FCPD in an age of onset 20 to 35 years, MODI 6 to 35 years, ketosis prone diabetes 25 to 40 years, type 2 10 to 30 years when it's young onset, and the C-peptide levels may be good markers, low in FCPD, low intermediate in MODI. Uh, in ketosis-prone diabetes, low at diagnosis, normal later on. Elevated markedly in lipodystrophy, intermediate in the mitochondrial disorders. Syndromic forms, depending on what syndrome you're discussing, it's variable. Elevated mild to moderate in HIV lipodystrophy, elevated mildly in type 2 diabetes in the initial phases and low in undifferentiated lean diabetes, that is your protein-deficient form of diabetes. Pancreatic imaging is critical, and so also GAD antibodies when you're not sure of your diagnosis, because we found these patients who came to our clinic, they were previously evaluated at other centers, and they did not have these two tests done, and were on insulin or oral anti-diabetic agents, poorly controlled, lean people. But we found that a large number of them were GAN antibody positive and the remaining ones had calcification in the pancreas which clinched the diagnosis. So these are the common types. Your baseline algorithm, once again, I'm highlighting the basic tests which can be done at a primary or secondary care center. And of course, next generation sequencing is crucial uh, along revamped, along with uh, accessory Sanger sequencing and multiple ligand probe dependent amplification for patients who have deletions or insertions which may not be picked up by uh, next generation sequencing. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, my whole team, 
a uh, very large list of uh, doctors, uh, uh, outreach group, biostatisticians, the lab, uh, the dietitians, uh, the NMR spec rate, nuclear physicists, and uh, a number of residents who have worked with me, and the metabolic nurses who do all our dynamic testing, including the CLAM studies. So, like to acknowledge our multiple funding agencies and international collaborators who have also helped. Thank you very much for your patient listening, and I'd be very happy to answer your questions which you pose for me.